so um, I will now um, uh, turn to more serious things and to sort of look at um, Japan and where the first art came from. The Japanese islands themselves once formed part of the greater land mass, as you can see here. I think I'll come back to that one. And um, there uh, is um, archaeological evidence that once the um, Japan Sea was actually an enclosed sea, um, sort of almost like an enormous uh, lake that was um, attached in the northern areas up in, around so Mongolia and down here in the area of um, Korea. However, around uh, 12,000 years ago, um, there was a warming trend, and the glaciers um, from the north uh, started to melt and flooded these areas and flooded the sea, which rose up and opened passages to the north and also down here to the south, so that we have today um, the islands, the four main islands um, of Japan, that are quite distinct and separate from the mainland. Knowing that once the, that Japan was part of the mainland, however, helps us to understand um, how um, movement, um, both people and animals, have made their way um, to the um, east. Japan itself it consists of four islands, three of which are most important. Oh, here we have um, the large crescent-shaped island of Honshu that sort of reflects the uh, coastline of China um, and uh, Asia over here. So Honshu is the main island, the largest one, and we will be mostly concerned with this island and in particular with art that develops here in the Yamato Peninsula or the area of the Nara Peninsula today. There's then the small island of Shikoku and then the other island of Kyushu. Kyushu also is going to be an important player, particularly because of its proximity here to uh, Korea. So there's a sort of a direct line between Kyushu and then the um, western coast of Honshu because of um, its closeness to the mainland. Um, Hokkaido does not play um, a significant role really until the latter part of the 19th century. The people of Hokkaido, or the Ainu, who um, are physically actually distinct and different from the people of the three other islands, they manifest um, strong um, Central Asian uh, characteristics. And it really wasn't until politically Hokkaido became significant to the Japanese in, as I say, the late 19th century when the Russians were beginning to establish bases that Hokkaido was uh, absorbed into Japan. Um, and then we have the Ryukyu Islands way down to the south and um, Yokinawa um, down here. Um, these islands also have played a peripheral role. So we are, in fact, dealing um, with an insular culture. Um, this insular culture or island culture has given um, the Japanese a sense of invulnerability and security that's allowed them to develop a homogeneity that is based on um, language, and um, so, uh, specific uh, cultural developments distinct from those on the mainland. Many historians have um, remarked um, on the similarities between the uh, Japanese islands on the eastern um, edge of the continental shelf and the British Isles on the western um, uh, end of the European continental shelf. Um, each is um, peopled by um, people who have moved uh, from the mainlands, 
probably these were um, pushed out by force of population looking for more fertile lands, but finding themselves in an insular environment, they developed separate from the mainland and developed a very distinct sort of sense of self. So uh, Japan's geographic isolation resulted then in a highly sensitive awareness of what was outside her culture on the one hand, and particularly an awareness of the Chinese culture, and, a, and also an acute sense of self-consciousness and of her uniqueness on the other hand. And this manifests itself particularly in the artistic and aesthetic arena. And one could say that also of the, the British, awareness of the main cultures on the um, mainland of uh, the European continent, and yet the distinctiveness of being British. For many British, they, they still not are part of Europe. I'm sure some of you who are following the European common market and all the problems, um, there is that, there's that psychological sort of uh, awareness of not being apart from, being an outsider of, and then building up one's distinctiveness. <coughs> And so um, this brings us now um, to the um, first period, which is known as the Jomon period. This starts to develop around um, 12 to 10,000 um, BC with this uh, warming trend. And uh, from what we can gather from the um, early um, archaeological excavations, the people uh, were hunter-gatherers to begin with, and um, they lived in very simple abodes, uh, which were pit dwellings uh, that were um, essentially pits dug out of the earth uh, some of them uh, two to three feet deep. Mason, I think, says one and a half feet deep. But there definitely were pits in the ground uh, that were covered by thatched roofs. Uh, these are reconstructions of what the um, early Jomon uh, pit dwellings might have looked like. Um, that we can tell this from um, some of the later um, reliefs that we found on metalwork. But it does give us a sense that um, of building uh, that first took place um, in Japan. The uh, um, characters on the right um, are the characters for Japan. You'll, um, essentially, um, it uh, means Japan or the um, sun. This is the character for sun and uh, source. Uh, down here. And these are the kanji or the Chinese characters used to describe um, Japan and uh, the people who lived where the sun rose, where the sun was born, the beginning of the sun. Um, so uh, it's, it's very appropriate um, that Japan um, is known in this way. Um, when Marco Polo uh, first came to Japan, um, he um, called it um, Jiponga, and the term that we use um, is uh, sort of a transliteration of many interpretations um, of Nihon or uh, Japan. Um, these are characters also that you'll probably see in paintings and throughout uh, the readings, so, um, so characters to become familiar with. Here is um, a sketch of what perhaps an original um, building may have looked like. Actually, this may be a little bit later from Jomon coming into um, Yayoi. But you see that it is uh, um, set down into the ground and then thatched over a timbered structure. So a very simple way of life. I would also draw your attention to the ceramic ware here and back here and over here. The ceramics, these vessels were used to store and cook um, uh, uh, food in. Now, 
The earliest forms of um, Jomon um, ceramics are very simple. They've been called bullet-shaped um, vessels with pointed um, bottoms, which indicates that they had no stable base to stand on. Therefore, they were probably either suspended in some way by um, a rope, or they were actually stood um, in the ground, uh, holes would have been made in the ground for them, um, or stands could have been constructed out of wood. But at this point, they're highly unstable, so in a way, um, not particularly utilitarian. Um, the use uh, for them would be probably of, um, for a storage of uh, various um, uh, nuts um, and shellfish. The markings on the outside were uh, made from uh, twines and um, grass um, uh, um, that was sort of braided together and impressed on the wet uh, clay or on the damp clay and was made into um, designs and patterns as you see um, around here. And in other cases, sticks were used to um, etch in designs on the surface. Now, Jomon pottery is important because the earliest um, ceramics in the world um, date back to around 12,000 BC with these um, early pieces in Japan, far earlier than the uh, works from the Near East. So um, it seems that ceramic ware is something that developed um, naturally. It didn't take um, a, a lot of ingenuity for people to realize that mud um, would start to cake if left in the sun. And um, once fire was discovered, it was found that they could bake these uh, sort of mud bowls that they were making. So all over the world, so the ceramics uh, sort of industry developed uh, spontaneously, and a lot of it manifests very similar um, characteristics, whether it's in Central America, India uh, or the um, Mesopotamian area. And so hence, I think these are sort of natural impulses. And also, we have the natural impulse to decorate things, to, to beautify things that man makes. And that's what we see occurring here, um, is the cord markings, the Jomon, that's what has given um, the name to this early period. Um, the cord markings essentially beautify the outside areas, uh, or the outside surface. Most of the cord pieces came from um, central um, Honshu. The rolled stick um, designs, such as we see here, um, these um, came from the Kyushu area. And then there are uh, works such as this, which have shells embedded into them. And uh, these uh, came from the northern Honshu area. So there are three styles that, um, of early Jomon pots. They have shells in them, as we see here, combined uh, with a sort of a cord marking or stick marking. Then you have cord marks and, and rolled sticks. Now, as you can see with these two pots, we are moving into another, the sort of the middle Jomon period. I don't want you to get hung up on all of the stages, uh, because if you were a connoisseur, then um, every single stage becomes significant. But right now, I want you to be more aware of the type. And it's quite logical what happens from a pointed bottom that doesn't stand to um, a flat bottom that it does um, stand, as you can see here, and along here as well. Now, the, um, the parts uh, become uh, quite elaborate. That in t is an indication of sort of later time, whereas once the cord marks were sort of rather haphazard over the surface, now they are in very distinct um, 
horizontal registers in uh, various diagonals and twirls. But I draw your attention particularly to this design. It's uh, formed of arcs and line. This is the Chokomon design, which we will be seeing um, later in the um, a Kofun period. So the incipient beginnings of um, distinctly Japanese des um, uh, designs are already beginning. Now I think that some of the most amazing parts come from this um, period. Uh, they are quite wonderful. They are flamboyant, they're energetic, and you wonder where on earth did this come from? Uh, they, the early parts were very modest, very simple, um, they did become somewhat u uh, utilitarian, but then we have these that tend to have quite narrow, narrow bases, wasted bodies, uh, w uh, w I mean with a waist, W-A-I-S-T, uh, and then these elaborate um, tops which have these flanges with circles in them. Now ropes could have been um, placed through the um, openings here all the way around um, but also it's been thought that possibly it plays a more ritual purpose whatever we don't really know some um, sort of fertility rite may have been associated with it whatever um, they are quite distinctive there's no pottery in the world that looks like this so it's not going to be a very difficult type um, for you to remember um, I think it's just exciting and it shows that sort of um, wonderful so sort of creative um, spark that will so sort of keep spurting up and emerging um, uh, throughout our study of Japanese art here um, are two more. This one now actually has added relief work on the outside of the um, body of the vessel. And then there's this small vessel here that again has this open area worked in with these pod-like um, additions to the top. And the side images almost look like phases. This could be like a nose with two eyes, um, and, but it's actually a hole that goes through. Perhaps these are eyes. eyes. Uh, perhaps these are, in fact, um, feminine forms and they are associated with virtue with uh, sort of um, the the sense of the vessel as um, the container and also the vessel contain um, as an important sort of fertility um, uh, symbol uh, this um, is important because fertility rites associated as we'll see with Shinto are important particularly with an agricultural society um, well uh, and this is something that J Japan is increasingly uh, becoming at this stage um, and this is another small um, uh, vessel a small bowl that is more enclosed that has a very distinct uh, design over the shoulders that um, has the cord marking on it. This one has a spout now, which is very useful for uh, uh, pouring. So now the, um, the vessels are becoming more sophisticated and um, they, uh, they can be used in a variety of uh, different ways. But still the surface of them is important. Now these are all hand-built um, works and they're very low fired uh, clay so um, these to begin with would be um, sun-dried and then um, with low fired um, kilns very simple kilns um, nothing elaborate at this stage they're all unglazed as well Uh, these are a series of um, slides that I just want to show you to give you a sense of how the um, vessels were actually made. They were not thrown on a pot, they were made from slab and coil using the coil technique. Um, this is a very simple form um, and in fact it's the way most people are introduced to ceramics when um, right in sort of early kindergarten uh, period where one works with coils and sort of builds it up with one's hands um, in a simple way. Baskets are used to support the base um, as it is uh, built up. Mm -hmm. So the lower part here, is, this is a basket and then you get the um, upper uh, part being the actual clay. Uh, 
Um, over here, we can see a variety of different chord markings. These are designs that some of them actually uh, um, are beyond being a straight chord marking, but these are woven uh, pieces. So it's like woven matting that would have been impressed on the leathered surface of the actual ceramic bowl. And here is a cord uh, that has been made uh, to demonstrate how the cords would have been just rolled over the surface of the um, vessels in order to leave their imprint and design. And um, again, this is just a series of um, photographs showing how uh, after the vessel has been lifted, the top is built up, and we can see it step by step, and then how the addition of those um, decorative um, uh, flanges are put on the top, as you can see, and then sticks are used to decorate and, um, the des and design the surface, uh, then um, a wooden tool is used to actually carve off the excess um, uh, uh, ceramic pieces or to mold other pieces on. And uh, then the actual um, cord markings are applied at the end. And I can't quite see what's happened here. Oh, this is the original, and uh, this is the copy of it that has just been uh, made. So uh, this is uh, a work that dates back to probably around 3000 BC, and this is a contemporary uh, copy to show how it was made. Hmm? No, no, this is not on potter's wheel. This was made by the coiling technique, or done by hand. Uh, these are some of the um, uh, tools, simple tools that were also used, um, made of wood, and some of them might also have been made of stone. This is an interesting one here because the design is all the way around, so it can actually be rolled over the surface of the, uh, the vessel and leaving a continuous imprint all the way along. I mean, this, this fascination with surface um, uh, decor, surface um, enlivenment um, is very important, and we'll find that goes right through uh, to the Edo period. Um, the, the concern, uh, as I say, with beautifying an object and essentially making um, an aesthetic statement. Uh, this is just a close-up of um, some uh, sort of stick markings. These are actual st uh, made with sticks and impressions into the surface um, of the vessel. Okay, um, now here we have, um, uh, this is an old kiln um, that has been um, excavated uh, from the late Jomon period. Uh, it uh, is an old, uh, uh, made um, also from, um, it's made actually from stone, and the fires would have been put inside, um, or underneath, then the uh, vessels inside, and this was a, a, a place for the um, heat to escape. So a very sort of simple form of kiln was used at this uh, time. Um, now I'm just showing you some more very lovely uh, pieces uh, where you can see again the uh, flamboyant treatment of the um, upper part of the vessel, a uh, long uh, body. I mean, it's almost sort of anthropomorphic in a way. You can sort of sense this, the sort of the lower part of the body, then you get the upper part of the body, even sort of with like uplifted arms. These are two pieces that we actually um, have in our own museum. Um, now, before we all get uptight with the numbers of pieces, um, they're all on the study guide. This is B60, P932 on the left, and B62, P52, on P55 on the right. Kakudo, one and two. I'm not going to do this, though, after this. I, I'm going to tell you that these are in the museum. You've got a reference on your study guide, and also in here. So you will have sort of a reference to all the museum pieces. What I would like to do is draw your attention to that these are in our collection. 
You've got it here. And then I will be showing you many other works that um, will enhance what we have in the collection. I'm trying to, give, to contextualize the work so that you'll get an understanding of how they fit in, what they mean. Um, so I'm not going to be uh, just talking um, on our own pieces. I think already you could sort of sense where they belong. Um, and um, associate them with the pieces I've already been talking about. Again, um, two more pieces um, from the museum. This work here, very similar to that other spouted work th that we saw. It's a, a very pretty piece with additive uh, pieces on the shoulders. And then we get this wonderful work here, which um, probably is um, an incense burner, because the top is enclosed, therefore it makes it impractical to sort of put things inside. But um, incense could uh, be placed inside, and then the the um, uh, sort of smoke uh, and the perfumes could sort of come out uh, through the holes. Now, some of the most endearing pieces uh, from the Jomon are dogu. Dogu are figurines made of low-fired uh, clay, um, all again unglazed. These are small images uh, varying in size from about uh, three inches to about nine inches, the largest. Uh, they are all um, anthropomorphic, or seemingly so, but in a highly abstract way. They um, reflect, again, the images that we have seen, um, early pieces, I'm sure, that you um, saw from the um, Shang period um, in China, and the early Indus Valley uh, pieces that we saw in, Japan, in India. Um, the figurines that would be used usually for ritual purposes, very often, again, for fertility. And when I use that term fertility, I'm not just using it for sort of human fertility, but I'm using it in the broader universal sense of uh, sort of um, agricultural uh, fertility, of which man is just a very small part. So um, what we see are these extraordinary sort of figures. Some of them have uh, heart-shaped uh, faces with pronounced round eyes, and this looks like a mouth. And it's wearing earrings. The hair appears to be done in a very distinctive way. These appendages are sort of like vestigial arms in some way. And then we get the legs down below, uh, which have cord markings on them. What is interesting is this treatment here that has been interpreted both, both as um, a phallic symbol and a vagina. And so we've, it's, and this is something that we'll see in both of them, in many of them, where they seem to be androgynous figures that uh, sort of um, uh, have both of the sexes um, within them. Then we get a piece like this, which is really hard to make out. Um, and one sort of really wonders, uh, this is sort of where the eyes were, that we've got this sort of small, uh, possibly phallic symbol. This could be the womb right here. We're not sure. There's a lot of speculation. Um, and uh, not, no one has really been able to come up with anything concrete. Um, now, these are some more of the heart-shaped uh, figures, uh, or heart-shaped faced figures. They, they really are quite lovely, very endearing. Um, the eyes are actually protruding, and the nose is um, very distinctive. Again, the arms have this very strange sort of um, uh, small vestigial sort of stump-like treatment to them. And here, the legs um, are very wide. The, the, this area, of course, being uh, resembling the, the womb area. But then we get that line coming up, um, possibly a phallic symbol, and then um, protruding um, breasts as well. Uh, this is actually the back. So here you see the back of this one. And there's a hole. It's almost like um, one could s put a rope through the back there and suspend the piece. And then maybe it could even be worn as some sort of amulet. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. 
Uh, now here we have a gr wonderful uh, sort of face. So I can't tell, you know, whether he's shouting or singing or grimacing or what, um, but it looks almost like a Halloween pumpkin. And uh, it, it's a, a marvelous uh, face. Uh, the body is quite simply done. Again, you've got the funny little arms that are sort of extending out. And then we get this strange figure here, this vertical sort of line here, now ending in the curl at the top, but with no um, recognizable sort of um, facial features at all, but definitely has some sort of um, anthropomorphic sense to it. It's sort of like the abominable sto snowman. <laughs> Uh, but very distinctive, though. Uh, here are some more pieces. Um, another one uh, which has this uh, face that you can't... It's almost like it's calling, it's shouting, perhaps even deep breathing. Um, that's another possibility. Here, um, again, we get this um, vertical phallic symbol, but also with the breasts and um, with the, the... I want to call it the, the um, linger and the yoni. Um, you know, it's sort of... Uh, but incorporating these... Um, um, images within themselves. But what I find interesting is if you look at this face, it appears that possibly it is a mask because there's a very distinct shelf, um, an edge to it. And if this is so, it may indicate some sort of um, medium or some sort of shamanistic role that is being um, played. And these are figurines resembling the shaman. Um, and so perhaps these are um, sort of uh, three-dimensional objects um, that are uh, used by shamans in their rituals, but also um, reflecting what they may look like. Again, this is one, another one with the vertical um, lying down the front, very um, pronounced use of the breasts as well. Um, let's see. Here, the breasts here. But then the, the, the top, perhaps that's a helmet. It's very hard to tell. And then, talking about helmets, this definitely is um, some sort of helmet. This, this has been described as a beekeeper. Well, um, it does look like a sort of a beekeeper's helmet, but whether that was the case or not, one, you know, one's not sure. It's also been described as a woman warrior because of the pronounced breasts, but of course we do have the phallus as well. And whether this really is a woman warrior, we just don't know. And then we get uh, a figure like this, which is quite distinct. Um, it also has a more pronounced uh, feet as well. But you get the small breasts and that vertical line. Uh, this one is one of the truly enigmatic characters. Uh, it's got an extraordinary, almost feline type of uh, face to it. However, uh, the um, body sort of uh, has like an arm and with webs. This is almost like a sort of a duck's um, uh, sort of um, webbing uh, between the uh, um, joints of the, the fingers, whatever. It also, the body is covered with or impressed with um, a, a dotted pattern. This has, um, uh, it's been suggested that this is possibly um, fur or it might even be a robe that's being worn. Again, it is hard to tell. I think there's the possibility that uh, maybe this again is a mask um, because of the way in which it is sort of added on to the um, sort of front of the head area. Of course, this is all uh, presumptuous. And then we get these uh, wonderful uh, dogus. All of these um, uh, come from like the middle and late uh, Jomon period. These are hollow uh, figurines. They're not solid. Very um, thin walls, which uh, is, is important because um, the thin walls indicate a, a sophisticated treatment of the clay and the ability of the craftsman to handle the clay in this way. Now, 
These um, are like bug eyes. They, they uh, look like sort of um, flies that you've, you've seen under a magnifying um, uh, glass. These ones have also been described as wearing snow goggles. Whether um, in sort of 5,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 BC, whether they in fact were wearing snow goggles, I don't know. Um, but again, it could be some sort of uh, mask. Some um, also, uh, if it is a, a fact that you know, it, if this does come from the snow areas, when, and from sun, you do close your eyes to try to keep the sun out. But um, it's also uh, been associated with the significance of the eye as being essentially the um, passage to the inner soul, to the spirit. And because these are hollow, um, it could be a receptor for the uh, kami. Again, speculation. I'm fascinated by the actual um, uh, uh, textile or seemingly sort of body cover textiles that the figures are wearing, a uh, very distinctive type of patterns. Uh, the in this instance, the um, uh, vertical line has sort of convoluted into these wonderful curlicues, but we do get um, the breasts. So um, dogu come in all shapes and um, sizes. Uh, now, this here is um, a photograph of some tr tribals from Soma in Ethiopia who are actually doing body painting with a, sort of a white flower-based uh, paint. And I'm showing you this because uh, th th there is the possibility that these designs that we've seen on all of the dogu are, in fact, uh, reflections of decorating the body and body paintings. Another has a suggestion, of course, is that they are wearing um, a form of clothing, and that is a possibility. But I think particularly with regard to the um, faces um, and the treatment of the faces, the painting of the faces, um, that um, does call from some other treatment beyond um, a, a, a textile. Also, we see the, the breasts so clearly. Um, that's another thing. And now, this woman is from Hokkaido. She's an Ainu, and uh, this is a photograph that was taken um, in the 1920s. And if you um, look carefully, you see that her mouth um, has been tattooed. So that's uh, like a tattooed mo moustache. So there's the possibility also that the body may have been tattooed as well. Um, the, the whole body and, of course, the face, which reminds me, of course, the tattooing, some of you may be familiar with uh, the um, very elaborate and developed form of tattooing um, that is excellent in Japan today, where whole body tattoos uh, take place. Maybe some of that was going on um, at this time. So these are sort of things to um, think about. And uh, then these are two small heads, um, both of which um, are in our um, collection here. And I managed to get uh, um, uh, slides of it without, before I, uh, but I'd already done the study guide. So these are pieces that we have, and the reference, of course, will be in. Um, uh, Yoshiko uh, Kakudo's um, catalog. So this gives us uh, an introduction to this very vital period um, of uh, the sort of Neolithic period of um, Japanese history the pre-historical time when extraordinary things were beginning to be made. And it indicates a very strong aesthetic and creative sense. So um, let's take a break now, just 10 minutes. I really encourage all of you to do is to go upstairs. You're going to get exercise now. You have to walk upstairs. And that's even better for you. Um, and to visit the galleries to look at the Japanese ceramics that are on display, and it's all up there. So uh, it'd be, uh, it, I would highly recommend you doing it sort of like right after the class, so it's right fresh in your memory. Or whenever you're in the museum, just, just walk past. Every time you look at them, it, uh, these things will start to become ingrained um, on your conscience. So we're really fortunate to be working uh, with this collection right here. Yeah.